Welcome back to another episode of the Carol and Click Middle East News Hour. I'm joined again by my co-host, Gotti Taub. Hi, Gotti. Hi, did you miss me? I missed you. I really did miss you. We had a terrific show with Dan Diker last week, but I'm glad to have you back. Yeah, it was good. Thanks. I, I see I see we're reaching more and more people, so that's great. That's great. And so you remember, guys, Real Clear Politics already paid attention to us. They put us up on their podcast, which is terrific. Real Clear Politics, we'd be happy if you did it again. But in the meantime, <laughs> all of you watching us, be sure to uh, to subscribe to our channels on Rumble and on YouTube and to share our videos far and wide, because the most important thing today in the war of ideas is to get the ideas out there. So please share our videos. And without much ado... Uh, why don't we turn really to our 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 uh, issues at hand today? And what Gadi and I are going to be discussing today is really the fallout from uh, the latest round of war between Hamas, the terror organization that runs the Gaza Strip, and Israel. And we're going to talk about uh, about the lessons learned more or less from the latest uh, spasm of violence, the latest spasm of war from four perspectives. We're going to talk about what it teaches us about the nature of Hamas's regime. We're going to talk at length about what this teaches us about uh, the Biden administration, what its actual policies are in relation to Hamas and in relation to Israel and to the Palestinian Authority. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Western hatred of Israel that came out very clearly this week, particularly or most uh, most uh, notably and most powerfully on the progressive left, whether it's in the media or among politicians, and uh, what this means for Jews, because we've also seen a mass outbreak of anti-Semitic attacks uh, in the West, in the United States, and in uh, Britain, and in some other countries. And we're going to look at all of this against a backdrop of America's uh, efforts under the Biden administration to restore the uh, Iran nuclear deal, um, which guarantees Iran a uh, nuclear arsenal uh, by uh, 2030. So uh, without much ado, um, I want to talk, I want to start by talking about what we learned about Hamas's uh, regime. And I think it's important sort of as a segue to what we learned about the Biden administration, because one of the things that we learned um, is that one of the main things that we learned is that any thought of humanitarian support or reconstruction aid to Gaza is just a uh, euphemism for enabling uh, Hamas to rearm because um, Israel uh, attacked the primary targets that Israel attacked were Hamas's underground uh, city. We called it the metro, their underground system. They had about 100 miles dug of, uh, of tunnels that went off, you know, sort of like um, uh, uh, veins and capillaries from major hubs uh, in Gaza City and went from the north, northern Gaza Strip to the southern Gaza Strip. The tunnels were uh, Hamas's weapon for everything, whether it was their command control center, they had uh, they had uh, workshops for for building rockets and missiles, m missile storage centers, missile launch sites. Uh, it was where they were assembling their troops uh, to attack. Their assembly points for attacks into Israeli territory, um, and more. And the thing is, is that uh, they built this up over the past decade or so, to the and it cost them hundreds of millions of dollars, over a billion shekels. And this is. Hamas, which is supposedly cash strapped and doesn't have anything. So how did they pay for this? Well, it was in kind. They used all of the building materials that were imported into Gaza by international donors for reconstruction projects. They took all of it below ground and they built this massive tunnel complex, which is entirely military in nature. So we know that they did that. The other thing that they did was uh, in 2014, they used to have all of their missiles would come across uh, Egypt. They would come across from Egypt. Iran would bring them to Sudan, and then they would traverse all of Egyptian territory. They would be smuggled through the country into the Sinai Peninsula, and then they would be transited into Gaza through underwater, or I'm sorry, underground tunnels, uh, cross-border tunnels between uh, Gaza and the Sinai. And the Mubarak regime didn't care about it because they didn't think that Hamas threatened them, so they wouldn't do anything despite Israel's pleas. And then obviously the Muslim Brotherhood regime under uh, Mohammed Morsi didn't do anything because they were allied with Hamas. But then when 
uh, General Assisi overturned the uh, overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood regime and formed his own government. Um, he recognized that Hamas had an operational alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood. They were they assisted the Muslim Brotherhood in ousting Mubarak from power and in maintaining. They were sort of serving as their shock troops uh, uh, during the uh, tenure of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, regime in. Egypt and Hamas was also uh, cooperating with the ISIS forces that had seated in the Sinai. So the minute that Sisi recognized this, he realized that Hamas was also a threat to him, to his country, to Egypt. And so for the first time, he took action against those tunnels. He flooded them. He kicked out all of the smugglers and from their houses across the borders that they were using them to build the tunnels. So that ended the smuggling. But what happened after that? That was in 2014 and 2015. Hamas simply built its own domestic industry of rockets. And we had 4,300 rockets, more or less, that Hamas shot into Israel over a period of just 11 days. And almost all of them were domestically produced. Now, how did they produce them? Again, through humanitarian aid. Even today, the Americans are talking about the need to fix Gaza's water system, its sewage system. They have no potable drinking water there because their uh, sewage flows into their drinking system. So the international community, with U.S. support, has insisted that Israel allow hundreds of miles of water pipes to be imported into Gaza. And the chairman or the commander of the Islamic uh, Jihad, a a terrorist organization allied with uh, with, uh, Hamas, bragged the other day on television, on Lebanese television, that they used all of the water pipes to construct their rockets and their rocket launchers. So we're talking about an incredible story. All of the, all of the humanitarian aid, all of it, it was used to rebuild Gaza, and I mean, not Gaza, but Hamas's military machine. I mean, I, I find that just amazing because who cares, right? I mean, is, are the Americans concerned at all about this? Doesn't seem. And it's amazing how the media portrays this, uh, keeps portraying this as if it's really an answer to a humanitarian crisis, and always blaming Israel. So the the Hamas is not held accountable at all. One of my friends, someone you don't like, Carolyn, so I don't, so I won't mention his name. You but, can, uh, you can. Uh, always, <laughs> always says that that as that they they just assume that the West would and Israel would love their children more than they do, because we we are all we are always. Uh, susceptible to this extortion because children don't have clean drinking water, and then we, 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 as you know, Israel supplies them electricity even at war, even at time of war, we supply electricity for Gaza because we 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 don't even manage the simple thing when when we say when when pe- when others tell us, um, but but you but they won't have electricity for their hospitals. So in the middle of surgery, something, why is that not, never their responsibility? We should be saying, if you fire rockets, you do not get electricity. You don't get anything. And now uh, Israel is, is, is acting under very strict moral restraints, like no other army, despite all you hear from, I don't know, uh, the double standard commissions of all kinds of international bodies um it, and israel has developed a people the, the details about this war would probably only only seep out gradually but 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 we already know that the the intelligence was unprecedented in its accuracy and the development of accurate weapons ended up with that with with, with very few civilian casualties despite the fact that we're dealing with an organization which seeks to protect its rockets with civilians this there, there is no overemphasizing the horror of this thing because the, in this ho- whole emotional drama they they put their people in harm's way so that the death of their own people can be a, a moral card um, uh, held against Israel in the international arena. But but what I think what the media here is completely ignoring, and here the media is it's like the same it's the liberal media in America now. It the narrative trumps facts completely. Are portraying this war as a failure, while when you speak to sources within the army, they are overjoyed with the success of the extent to which they have managed to destroy the military infrastructure of the Hamas. People are talking about um, setting them years, perhaps a decade back, and this is 
crucial to Israel because our 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 our, our more serious front is the north. It's Iran. Uh, it's Hezbollah backed by Iran, possibly Iranian forces in Syria now. And under the Biden administration, they will probably this threat is probably going to grow exponentially. So when, if and when this 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 war comes, we will Hamas will be much weakened as a second front. Well, I agree. I think that it was really important that we were. I mean, we destroyed Hamas's entire operational uh, concept. I mean, one of the things that I left out of my explanation about the amounts of money that they spent and resources that they devoted to their tunnel complex is that Israel destroyed most, most, most of it. Uh, out of around 100 miles of tunnel, Israel destroyed apparently over 60. We don't know how many Hamas fighters were buried alive in them, uh, cause we don't, you know, they're not releasing those numbers. And by the way, that's another thing that we have to bear, bear in mind. You know, they, they put out these numbers of civilian casualties and military casualties on their side. There is literally no reason for anybody to believe anything that they're saying at all. And there's also no reason for anybody to think that the civilian casualties such as they are were, were caused by Israel. Because as you said, they use their civilians as human shields for all of their missiles. Moreover, 25% of their missiles were misfired and they exploded inside the Gaza Strip. And what's interesting, of course, and we'll get to this later, but is that Ilhan Omar, the anti-Semite you know, in chief in the US Congress, actually said that, that Iron Dome, Israel's missile inter interception uh, um, uh, system that that blocks out, you know, that is that was able to uh, uh, in what's the word to intercept almost all of Hamas's rockets that uh, that were shot into Israel. Well, where it's a racist system because it doesn't intercept Hamas's rockets that misfire and fall in Gaza. So, I mean, this is just you know the level of insanity that sort of has become characteristic of the attacks on us. But yeah, I mean, they Israel destroyed their operational concept. We they, they spent billions on this program, uh, you know, over the past decade, and now they can't use it. How many of their fighters are going to be willing to even go into the tunnels now uh, after they saw that Israel knows everything that they're doing? We also destroyed their naval commando force. You know, they had underwater tunnels. Um, and Israel de started de destroying them in a sh brief exchange of fire in 2018. And, uh, and uh, according to uh, the head of naval operations in the Southern Command, uh, in an interview that he gave with Macquarie Shone newspaper over the weekend, um, they destroyed, uh, the Navy destroyed, they were also very active in this war, and they destroyed uh, the uh, naval commando infrastructure of Hamas as well, which was completely, uh, you know, it, it's all, all of their operations are offensive. So this was, they, they had, but they have incredibly sophisticated armaments that they've either developed or imported. They had submarine, suicide submarines that are supposed to attach like torpedoes to Israeli naval craft and blow them up. So far, uh, Israel is responding and and uh, and destroying the infrastructure, the terrorist infrastructure of Hamas, only when there is a serious barrage of of rockets. First of all, we need to. I think we we need a a, a much more vigilant uh, approach. We we need to respond harshly to any rockets, not just wait till they also reach Tel Aviv. And secondly, we don't need an excuse at all to destroy. Uh, military infrastructure. We should, in, in, in uh, if we, uh, and I think that if we stop apologizing and we do that and not cooperate in this game of blame, um, and just just be confident in what we do, I think it, it will be better off all around. But any time Israel detects infrastructure that is designed for terror, it should destroy it. We shouldn't let them have 10 years to build their infrastructure and only then destroy it. They should learn that every step that we discover that is designed to kill civilians, we will respond. Look, I agree with you, um, but I think that that really brings us to our second uh, aspect of, you know, of our, of our, of our sort of taking apart what just happened uh, and analyzing it, which is the Biden administration, because um, I, I think that we're seeing that there's a really sinister uh, policy that uh, Biden and his advisors are are implementing here. We have uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken uh, today in Israel, and then he went to Ramallah, and he was saying some pretty, and he made some pretty astounding statements, um, which we'll get to in a second. But I think you know Israel 
is in a is in a bit of a not in a bit we're we're in quite a pickle with the Americans because the Biden administration is flat out without any question the most hostile administration we've ever seen. We saw, you know, a, a lot of people rightly refer to this as Obama's third term because it really is just a continuation of Obama's policies. But I think what's important here to recognize is that, and I may have said it in previous episodes, but it bears repeating, um, Obama was hostile from the outset. You know, his first foreign policy, major foreign policy address was at the American uh, University in Cairo. And he essentially um, threw Israel under the bus already at that time. And uh, he embraced the Muslim Brotherhood. He signaled his desire to uh, appease Iran. I mean, everything that he did in subsequent years was in that speech that he gave at the beginning of June of the first year of his uh, presidency. Edward Said could have given that speech. You're right. He could have, and and you know they were very close friends. You know, um, and uh, so there's there's no doubt about it. But I mean, so Obama, it was. I thought it was clear already in the campaign. I wrote about it and I warned about it during the campaign. In fact, I wrote about it and warned about it during the Democratic primaries when he was running against Hillary Clinton that he was truly, truly uh, anti-Israel and that he had some very radical positions on the United States as well. It was all out in the open. Just a question of whether anybody wanted to notice. At any rate, so uh, Obama uh, had this policy, but you know he, he because the Democratic Party when he came in was still very pro-Israel. Um, he he couldn't go too far out in front of his own party, and so it took him a long time. It took him until you know twenty fifteen to uh, conclude the nuclear deal with Iran, even though this was his goal all along. Um, and he had been denying it in his first term. Um, so he waited for seven years to get his nuclear uh, deal down and working towards realigning the United States away from Israel and away from its traditional Sunni uh, Arab allies. Although he, I mean, he supported the Muslim Brotherhood already during the Arab Spring against Mubarak in particular in, in, in Egypt. But all of these things happen gradually. All of them happen unfolded over time. And then, you know, his last act in office was pushing the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2334, which said that all Israeli Jewish presence beyond the 1949 armistice lines, including, by the way, at the Western Wall, uh, is, a, is a gross uh, violation of international law. Including where you're sitting right now. Oh. Of course. Well, I'm I'm a war criminal because I live in, I live in Afrat, the birthplace of uh, King David. So yeah. Uh, oh well. Um, but uh, but but the point is that it took a long time, and the reason why the Biden administration is so markedly more hostile than the Obama administration was is because the Biden administration is starting where the Obama administration left off, and even worse than that, uh, during the four years that the Democrats were out of power, the the Democratic Party, you know, a lot of people say they've been Corbynized, but really what they become is Obamafied, right? Because Obama's policies, which were to the left, the much to the left of the mainstream of the Democrat Party when he came in, are now considered moderate in 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 relation to where the Democratic Party has gone. So that uh, you know, he certainly, I'm sure, supports uh, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and AOC and Bernie Sanders and Liz Warren and all the rest of the very outspoken haters of Israel, Cory Bush. Um, but he, uh, but he was overseeing a party that wasn't that way, and now the party itself has become radicalized, and the administration is radical, and it wants to pick up where he left off, and that's why. Uh, it's so markedly hostile to Israel. But it's also playing a kind of double game because, first of all, um, Biden did do uh, some things that, that are objectively positive uh, for Israel or did uh, while the Operation uh, Guardian of the Walls was going on. First of all, he, he agreed that Israel had a right to defend itself. Uh, he also shielded us by vetoing m more hostile uh, decision at the uh, UN Security Council. Well, he didn't veto. However, he he tabled. He prevented. He he, de he he delayed discussion. He he prevented the the uh, effective 
uh, power of the Security Council to hinder Israel's military operation. And that's not a small thing at all. But but the thing is that that what the game he, they are playing is multi layered, and and I think they the, since they're. Their their big goal is the JCPOA. They're going to return to the Iran nuclear deal. What they want to do now is uh, is amass some cash, uh, some moral cash, some uh, um, uh, moral obligation uh, from Israel not to interfere them while they 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 step on ours and Saudi Saudi Arabia's head on their way. To appease Iran, and 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 the thing is that they the, this nuclear deal is such a complete fraud that that they're not even exactly trying to defend it. So even that we they are covering it up with this layer of talk about longer and stronger. Uh, Blinken is is here to he's I think he's the author of this phrase longer and stronger. But first they're going to give in to everything the Iranians want and then they will negotiate another treaty really will they what incentive on earth will iran have to put uh, shackles on its own hands after it receives everything it wants after it's been so, freed exactly so so this is the long term game of the, the the biden administration um and this is why it seems it seemed ambiguous it, it, in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but now, um, as 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 we know, he the Biden administration is reopening the consulate in East Jerusalem, so it's uh, signaling an opposite direction to the Trump administration's um, uh, um, uh, strategy of limiting the Palestinian veto over everything else in Israel's um, foreign relations. You know, I think that, that what you were saying about the consulate is, is very important. And I also think that it's important that, it you know, it is true that, and we'll get more into this in a second, but I think it's really important to talk for a second about what, what the U.S. policy is towards Hamas and what it is towards Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Because although everything is connected, um, they also stand on their own because we have to remember um, just how central rejecting Israel's right to exist uh, in uh, the absence of a Palestinian state or or claiming that Israel is the oppressor and that the Palestinians are victims of Israeli oppression is to the uh, Democrat uh, foreign policy. In fact, I mean, the Democrat foreign policy has become almost indistinguishable from the EU foreign policy because the EU, for its part, really only has one foreign policy, which is being hostile to Israel. And supporting the it, the Palestinians is a means to be hostile towards Israel without looking like you just hate Jews. And, you know, and so... That's but possibly, possibly they're 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 beginning to hate the Muslim Brotherhood more, because who what, who one, the the Europeans because strikingly, oh, oh, you're talking about, yes. Europe Europe was more moderate than America in its pressure on Israel. Um, this is the the best of my my memory. The f uh, first that Europe is more moderate. We've heard Angela Merkel no less say that Israel has a right to defend itself, which is a surprising thing to hear coming from Germany um, and, and Europe in general. And I think that they are just realizing that their problem with the Muslim Brotherhood is becoming, or their, or their problem with their Muslim communities and the Arab communities are just are spinning out of control. And they're suddenly, they suddenly find themselves, how should I say, if not sympathetic, then pragmatically aligned to uh, some of uh, Israel's predicament with with the, think, with the hostile neighborhood. I th think you're right. I think you're right. I think that you know there has been some. Uh, there there seems to be some realignment. Um, by the way, we saw that as well uh, with the nuclear talks. That uh, you know Nicolas Sarkozy, when he was president of France, he was much more. Uh, hard hard line on iran than obama was you know he he was very concerned about that even macron was i mean uh, they were going out in front of the tr with the french which is pretty you know pretty shocking and i think we're going to see a lot more of that with the biden administration as well but they also largely disregard the europeans and there are plenty of europeans who are happy and plenty of germans by the way who are happy to 
uh, be pro-Iranian because they have a lot of money invested in in Iran. Uh, but be that as it may, I think you know the the thing with the uh, Americans is that you know on the one hand there's the aspect of to 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 supporting the Palestinians against Israel, which is anti-Semitic, but I also think that there's an and that certainly is is very uh, blatant among the Europeans. But there's another aspect to it, which is that they this is just an ideological battle for them. I mean, the Palestinian war against Israel is supported by the Democrats today the way that they supported, you know, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong against the Americans in the Vietnam War, the way that they supported the Sandinistas against uh, the U.S.-backed Contras uh, in the 1980s in Nicaragua. Um, and uh, so this is the, sort of the new cause celebre of, of the American left, and it's really amazing. So that there's some of that. So I think that it's important to place it into the context of the larger American realignment away from Israel and the Sunnis and towards that. And then the final aspect to it is that there's an instrumental value from the American perspective of uh, supporting the uh, Palestinians against Israel, um, which is that they think that they can, uh, they can fragment or undermine the um, the Abraham Accords and the operational alliance between Israel and the Sunni Arab states that are equally threatened by Iran that uh, stands at the base of those accords by putting pressure on Israel regarding the Palestinians. They think that that's the way to, to, to divide the Arabs away from Israel, that the Arabs won't dare stand with Israel on the Palestinian issue and so that's the way to do it. The more emphasis they place on it, the more stress the Abraham Accords will become. And they want to stress the Abraham Accords. They want them to uh, to be destroyed, to be undermined, because they think, um, because they know, and because that Iran hates them, and they and they agree that I or they they believe that Iran is right to hate them, because the Abraham Accords. And I wrote this in my article in in Israel Ayom last Friday. Um, you know they present the possibility of containing Iran even without American support. So um, I just read today um, that uh, uh, the UAE is developing an island off the course of coast of Yemen that presumably could be used uh, to attack the Houthis or could be used uh, to strike Iranian interests in the Bab el Mandab area. So you know these are these are things that. Uh, threaten Iran, and they certainly threaten an America that is trying very hard to distance itself from the Arabs and to harm the Arabs, and like you said, to step on the heads of the Israelis and the Saudi Arabians in their sprint towards Tehran. I, I think you're, I, I'm, I'm slightly less optimistic than you about the future of Saudi-Israeli cooperation, because I think that, that the minute they, the Saudis understand that there is no American backing, they they will not think that they can go it alone with Israel or with their Sunni partners. And we already see Mohammed bin Salman, um, who compared Ali Khamenei to Adolf Hitler, no less, has suddenly been talking about the need to uh, iron out differences with Iran and so forth. Oh, absolutely. So and they- you saw that today that uh, at least uh, for a while, the Saudis announced that they were suspending Israeli uh, overflights over uh, Saudi airspace, which is a major strike at the Abraham Accords, and again, all of this owes to American pressure. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and 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 um, the the along with that, we know that the Biden administration actually forbids all that are serving in the administration to even call them the Abraham Accords. This is this is just striking because everybody understands what a stroke of genius the name of the Accords is. Because it, it says, let Jews and Arabs go back in history, not to the beginning of the schism and the, the wars between Jews and Muslims, but back to the patriarchs when we were once Brothers. one Semitic family. So the Abraham Accords is, and it enabled, and you saw this in Saudi Saudi Arabia because you know the the, the Palestinians are 
are I, I won't say universally, but widely hated in the Amer in in the Arab world because this is the cause celebre that was forced on the Arabs, and they always have to pay lip service to this thing. And the Palestinians are always taking the money and not doing anything. And 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 Israel is of course a, a greater temptation to countries like Saudi Arabia, which don't have any beef with us in terms of realpolitik. They they can, they can only they can only benefit with cooperation with Israel and they can't do it and they can't protect themselves from Iran because they always have to pay tribute to this um, recalcitrant people who is not aiming at a two-state solution, not aiming at peace. It's aiming at the destruction of Israel. And since this is a, an impossibility from the point of view of the many uh, Sunnis in the, in the region, they're just paying for someone to knock their heads against a concrete wall endlessly and they all it, and it's the arab head everyone is suffering from from this and so you saw i i i picked up some you know now telegram now the the, the mainstream media is just a, a it's just a narrative construction there's no there's no reason to watch them so telegram has become you one of the you should tell my greatest, husband that i keep trying to uh, tell him that and he insists that we have to watch it stop watching it's, television it's, it's, it's mind no and, watch your and wife's mid east hour what's wrong with you um he does, and don't and worry. And 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 so now, and especially now that Facebook is blocking uh, right wingers on 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 WhatsApp too. Now that we know right wingers suddenly found themselves out of WhatsApp since Mark Zuckerberg uh, has taken it over. So it, so um, people move to Telegram, and in Telegram you have amazing channels. One of my favorite is Abu Ali. Express. It's a good one. It's excellent. It's a great one. This guy is is an Israeli intelligence, most probably an Israeli intelligence officer. No one knows who he is. I wanted to inject something that he said when you when you said the Palestinians lie about their uh, civilian casualty because Abu Ali is he's really smart. So what he did when there was the, the return the 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 right of return so called demonstrations and they said children were hit and they had this list of dead children he went and found those names and he went to the hospital website and he found them and then he found them in uniform on the Hamas website like there some of them are children there were 17 uh, year old combatants like with weapons so so he's great and and what and what he partly pointed at because he's so subtle in his understanding of the arabs he said look this is he showed something from a, a travel agency in riyadh and he said look they're advocating now or, or it's in the in the emirates they're advocating a trip to israel where they put the israeli flag in the same picture as the al aqsa mosque they're saying come to israel and visit yet, the mosque. In peace and visit the mosque, which is whenever the Palestinians want to start a riot, they say Israel is going to destroy the mosque. So, I, you know, in, in, in the Arab imagination, that is really sticking a finger to the Palestinians. Absolutely. So America is going to force the drama back into everyone supposedly supporting the Palestinians uh, and the Palestinians lying about their intentions and all the money sinking back into terrorism and by the way also into unra which is a, 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 um, the the, the so-called refugee agency right. do you which, know how many do you know what percentage of unra employees are actually hamas terrorists in gaza no 90% 90% so actually uh, one of the reasons why President Trump defunded UNRWA is because he's not allowed to fund terrorist organizations, which is also the reason why the U.S. hasn't directly funded humanitarian assistance of any kind to Gaza since Hamas seized power over the Gaza Strip in 2007. Um, and, and here I think it's important to start talking about the Biden administration's actual plan. And I ran into, uh, I mean, they say, right, Bi Biden in his ceasefire address or whatever last Thursday night, he said that the United States was going to be working with the UN uh, and uh, with the Palestinian Authority to, you know, rebuild Gaza. And you always got to wonder, why are you in such a rush to rebuild Gaza? What is exactly, the th what are the things in Gaza that were just destroyed? They were all their military infrastructure. So when you say you want to rebuild Gaza, you're actually saying, you know, Israel didn't, you know, bomb kindergartens. They didn't bomb synagogues. I mean, synagogues. They didn't, Israel didn't bomb hospitals and the rest. Um, they bombed Hamas war material and infrastructure. So the point that, you know, 
here is that um, he said this. He said, but we're not going to fund anybody from Hamas. But I found over the past week a document that was written by uh, Hadi Amar, who is now the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Israel and the Palestinians. He wrote it in the Brookings Institution in 2018. He was the lead author of this uh, group plan. And they set out a new U.S. policy for Gaza. All right. And really what it is, it's 52 pages long and it is a proposal for a U.S. policy towards the Palestinians in Israel uh, that would, uh, you know, follow the Trump administration's policies. And he has and all of it, by the way, almost to the letter, in fact, to the letter is already being implemented. So I think it's a very important document. It's incredibly boring. You know, you need to read it. You, ne you need to drink about 10 pots of coffee, you know, just to get through the executive summary. So, I mean, this was, this was like a major undertaking on my part to read it. And, uh, it, and, and it was deliberately boring. I mean, the, the language of these things is always deliberately obtuse so that people won't get through it and they won't think about the implications of what uh, they're reading. So I'm just sort of going to give the summary to save all of you from having to read this thing. So Hadi Amar essentially had three components to his plan. So, and he and he wanted to start it all after the next round of fighting between Israel and, and Hamas, because that's the opportunity to really push forward on this plan. So a couple of things that he said that, that they had to do that the Biden administration had already done was reinstate U.S. funding to UNRWA and to the Palestinian Authority. Um, and there was one other thing I don't remember offhand, but whatever. So these were things that they had already done. And of course, the U.S. can't fund the Palestinian Authority because of the Taylor Force Act that bars them from funding the Palestinian Authority as long as the Palestinians continue to fund terrorism. They didn't stop, but that doesn't matter. The Biden administration, they reinstated the funding um, and also to UNRWA, despite the fact that the vast majority of its employees are members of a terrorist organization. So those are the two things. But then he also said what the goals are. So he's, he, he wants the United States to essentially legitimize uh, Hamas, uh, despite the fact that it's illegal. He wants the United States to get right back into the aid game to Gaza, to enrich them, to enable them to rebuild uh, even though, uh, like I already set out, you know, they use all of the humanitarian aid they receive to develop their missiles and their tunnels and all of their other offensive mechanisms. So that's one thing. He also wants Israel to drop the blockade of Gaza's coastline to enable transit of, of Gazans into Israel uh, to work, to transit Israel into the Palestinian Authority. Uh, so, you know, and to end all restrictions on imports into Gaza. So any dual use items they want, they're supposed to be able to get. He wants Israel to lower its all of its defensive actions against Hamas. These are uh, his policies that all seem to be uh, resonating in actual U.S. policy today because he's not only the architect of the policy, but as assistant deputy or deputy assistant uh, secretary of state for Israel and the Palestinians, he's also the main implementer of this policy. He was the guy that Secretary of State Blinken dispatched here to advance U.S. policy towards Israel and Hamas during the war. So that's Hadi Amar's first thing regarding Hamas. Regarding the Palestinian Authority, he wants the United States to force Israel to transfer 50% of the land that Israel currently controls under uh, in, in Judea and Samaria to Palestinian control by transferring it from area C to area B. Um, this is, of course, a impossibility, but whatever. Uh, so that's one thing. He wants uh, the Palestinian Authority to unify ranks with Hamas to enable the PA to go back into Gaza in civilian functions. And he wants Israel to uh, continue to work with the PA even after it becomes dominated by Hamas. And that's another thing, just parenthetically, any unification between the PLO-controlled uh, Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria and Hamas will lead to the formation of a dual entity that is entirely dominated by Hamas, because Hamas is a much more powerful among Palestinians than the PA is. So basically, he wants the PA to serve officially as a fig leaf for Hamas, give Hamas control of Judea and Samaria, of the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria, as well as maintain and expand its control over 
over Gaza. This is his policy, and he also. I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to underestimate the danger in this policy. But we should also point out the naivete, because which is very American, and the the, the Americans assume there is always a middle, right? There's always you have two positions. There are always there's always a middle, but there isn't because um, we we should remind our uh, our listeners and viewers that in. 2006, there were held the last elections for the Palestinian Authority, and where Hamas won, it took over. And when it took over, it threw the Palestinian Authority people with uh, blindfolded from four-story buildings. So, so it's not they they don't live so easily together. Second point is that Israel, the the only reason that the Palestinian Authority survives is the Israeli bayonets. Only Israel is standing between the Palestinian Authority and the violence of uh, Hamas. And therefore, there is a kind of symbiosis against any solution. Because in in some sense, the occupation or the military rule over uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, which Israel holds more so outside Area A, but it, it, it also penetrates Area A, sometimes in the service of the Palestinian Authority in order to pick out terrorists for them, but so that they can keep blaming us. So they can complain about the occupation while enjoying the services of the of the IDF. And secondly, you know, I, I created a, a little bit of a Twitter storm, um, angering not only my, my uh, the followers who agree with me on the right, but also those who are who disagree with me on the left, they, are, they were all united when I said we should not destroy Hamas in Gaza because we should, we should keep their head down. But, the, what, but Israeli interest is to prevent, is, is to divide and rule. I don't disagree and, with you and, at all. No, I don't disagree with you. Carolyn, we, we haven't managed to disagree about a single thing since we began this. This is outrageous. I'll, I'll talk to you about Ram if I have no choice. Well, we we um, can talk about the Arabs, but I think we're gonna we're gonna try to cut it short today because uh, yeah, well, we're gonna try we're to we're not gonna try to cut it short. We're gonna try not to go over our allotted time. <laughs> this is a news hour, not the news hour in twenty minutes. So that's what we're gonna try to do today. Um, but I just wanted to go back to Hadi Amr's thing because I think it's important. He also said that um, he he wanted to scale back the damage that uh, the decision to move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem and to close the Jerusalem consulate is going to has caused to U.S. relations with the PA with the Palestinian Authority. And um, so before uh, Tony Blinken announced that they were going to reopen the consulate, they had already announced that they were sending the former consul general, Michael Ratney, uh, back to Jerusalem, this time as acting ambassador. Um, and that was a very clear signal that, you know, they plan to downgrade Israel's uh, or the the job of the embassy in Jerusalem in terms of being the uh, go between between the U.S. government and the Israeli government, and use it more as a means to communicate with the Palestinians and probably outsource the work to Tel Aviv, which, by the way, is deeply unpopular on Capitol Hill. You know, you had 97 senators voting for a resolution uh, reinstating their support for the embassy in Jerusalem. Just you know. I think a couple of months ago. So this is, you know, not, this is a very unpopular plan in, in Washington. But the thing about the consulate is that it's really hostile because under the, the uh, Vienna Accords for diplomatic, uh, whatever it's called, representation offices, I, I, the, um, you need to get the permission of the host government to open a consulate on their territory. Because when, when the Trump administration shut down the D Jerusalem consulate, they shut it down. And so opening up a consulate in Jerusalem is not reopening an already existing one that was suspended. It's opening a completely new legation of the U.S. government in Jerusalem. And under international law, they can't do that without Israel's permission. So they're putting Israel in a bind because Israel already understands how hostile they are. If Israel uh, just lets them step on us and doesn't say anything and doesn't demand that they uh, accept that this is part of our sovereign territory, then essentially, I talked about this with uh, law professor Eugene Kantorovich before we spoke, just to make sure that I had it right. If we if we do this, then it means that um, basically we're accepting that the Biden administration has rejected, has undermined, has erased Trump's 
recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So, you know, Israel has, uh, I think, uh, we have to get out in front of this by saying, you know, if the United States wants to open up a consulate to serve the Palestinians in Jerusalem, you know, we have a we have a an embassy in uh, Costa Rica, or I think it's, or maybe the consulate and you know we have we have consulates that or embassies that serve several different governments at once, you know, several different countries at once. So if they want to have a consulate in Jerusalem to serve a place that's not uh, in Israel, that's fine, but they have to get our approval for it. And we have to say, we'll be happy to approve it because otherwise we're stuck. They're going to do it regardless. And if we don't get in front of it, then we're going to uh, accept, uh, some form of, uh, downgrade of us recognition of Jerusalem. So this puts us in an, an, an unpleasant situation. And I think, you know, all of these things taken together, the legitimization of Hamas, you know, the Hadi Amar talked about changing the law to lower the risk of prosecution for U.S. contractors that do work in Gaza, despite the fact that they're providing material support for a terrorist organization. You know, these are things that are that are shocking. Their support for the Palestinian Authority that that Blinken announced in Ramallah today is also in contravention of of U.S. law that bars them from supporting an organization that funds terrorism. So you know these are these are deeply deeply hostile positions. They relate to Iran, but they're also um, a function of the hostility that this uh, that this administration harbors towards Israel and towards the Jewish state. Um, and a lot of that obviously is shared by the progressives, which was the last thing that we wanted to discuss today. And just, you know, the last few minutes that we have, we saw, you know, uh, spasms of violence against Jews in the streets of New York, Los Angeles, and other cities in the United States, uh, a vandalization of synagogues and of other Jewish institutions. We saw the same kind of thing in London. Um, and, uh, then the media, you know, and, um, and and it's all being fueled. It's being fueled in the United States and led by these openly anti-Semitic lawmakers in Congress that nobody will stand up to in the Democratic Party. You know, APAC put out this very, you know, as is its want, you know, put out a sort of very par of milk toast kind of uh, uh, ad against Ilhan Omar, who really uh, said some viciously anti-Semitic things over the past week and a half. Not that this is surprising or uncharacteristic for her, but Nancy Pelosi herself came down very hard against APAC, attacking APAC for attacking uh, an anti-Semitic, out of control, and incredibly powerful member of Congress, Ilhan Omar. Yeah, this I'm I'm looking as we speak because I saw this this headline in the the New York Times was just outrageous, uh, and I don't remember what it was, but it 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 sort of it blamed Israel for violence against Jews in New York. Right. So I think it was it, Michelle it, Goldberg's sort of a roundabout article. way. Yeah, and, and th this is we're I think we're going to see more and more of this, and I regrettably I think we're going to hear this more and more. From progressive Jews, because the Peter Beinarts of the world, um, the way that they preserve their peace with the progressive wing to which they feel they belong is increasingly Israel bashing. And let me remind you that Beinart himself has has crossed the line into explicit anti-Semitism, not by my definition, but by the definition of no less a credentialed leftist than Amos Oz, who said that if you recognize the right of all peoples to self-determination except the Jews, then you you are an anti-Semite because you're singling the Jewish people out as less deserving of, 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 of what other people deserve. That's right. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, I saw it, I was in South Africa in, in 2010 and, uh, I was there at the invitation of the South African Zionist Federation. And, um, I, I was on stage, uh, debating a, uh, South African Jewish, uh, woman, uh, who was an anti-Israel activist. And the, my hosts explained to me that, you know, um, it's a real, the post-apartheid South Africa presents a problem for young Jewish people because uh, they no longer can be anti-apartheid, which was how Jewish leftists uh, felt that they were making a contribution to South Africa for, for generations. And uh, now that apartheid's over, unfortunately, the ANC 
is deeply, deeply hostile to Israel, and South African politics are increasingly pro Hamas and anti Semitic. And so, for, and, and, and the anti, and, sorry. No, yeah. and I'm just going to say, and for young Jews who want to be politically active, the only place where they can find um, an audience for their for themselves as political activists is is as anti Israel activists, as as Jewish fig leaves for anti Semites in South Africa, right. and that's exactly. what's coming. And we, and in, we, in, that's what's happening now increasingly in America, in America among American Jews. And, and we we see this already in the fact that the ADL is controlled by Obama people. So under the Trump administration, they were counting anti Semitic incidents. They have a, a, a problematic way of counting, but they they did not uh, identify separately. Um, anti-Semitic incidents on campus, because this is obviously the work of the left, and they wanted to, to point the rise of anti-Semitic incident. Although campus violence was was the major category, they wanted to to hold Trump accountable for it. And now, of course, they're not they're not holding Biden account accountable for anything. But these people are legitimizing the squad, and this squad I saw. AOC in an interview talking about the occupation, and, and this innocent interviewer asked her, uh, "What do you mean occupation?" And she didn't know. She she said, "Well, I'm not an expert on geopolitics, but they have this they have this 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 uh, progressive rhetoric which needs no evidence and no facts, and and in this and in this Israel is automatically to blame, and this is becoming the official line of the party. And let me remind you that that that." Um, President Biden himself said when he was vice president that the problem that America has in the region is its allies. Um, so, so don't be surprised when the president of the United States is defining Israel and Saudi Arabia as the problem that Jews then want to distance themselves from the problem in order to be progressive. And then when there is a rise in anti-Semitism, of course, that has nothing to do with them. And, and they don't even notice that the fact that it's, 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 be, it became a BLM cause. It's and and this is so striking because if there's one thing that the Democratic Party will not distance itself from at any price, it's Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter have taken out to the streets to demonstrate against the right of Israel to defend itself. And the and the party is going, I'm sure, is going to al align itself behind that. And progressive Jews are going to be right there up front because they still want to show that it's a summer of love and they're going down to Mississippi to fight for, for integration. I, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that you're correct. I think, though, that, you know, what really is going to be... Uh, a defining a defining uh fight for America whether the United States is going to overcome uh the place where it is today where you have uh anti-American forces now dominant in American society and they're really taking a skewer to American power to the American economy to American freedom to American civil rights obviously freedom of speech is the first victim of this uh critical race theory uh, uh jihad against americanism and and american values and the american way of life uh but um you know, uh, the question of whether the United States is going to become a full-on anti-Semitic country along the lines that we've seen in Western Europe uh, over the past generations is really going to be determined by this. We do see a lot of pushback. You know, um, one of my favorite websites, Legal Insurrection, had an had a uh, had an important analysis of uh, of an op-ed that the New York Times published last week. And I have to admit that I'm much more interested in reading what Legal Insurrection says about that than reading the actual article. But the uh, but the inter but the explanation was that this uh, op-ed in the New York Times presented data that showed that support for Black Lives Matter has crashed over the past year, and it was peaked after George Floyd was killed a year ago, and it's just gone down since then, and it's very very low, and it's gone down among Hispanics as well as whites, um, and it has even plateaued and gone down a bit among Black Americans. So. Um, you know, as people become more disenchanted with this, and, and it can happen very quickly because it's so alienate, alien to the American way of life, uh, Marxism is, 
um, then, uh, you know, we may see an awakening. And if that happens, and I think, you know, a lot of the license that we're seeing for anti-Semitic violence, for anti-Semitic politics, for anti-Semitic politicians is going to be diminished. But as it is today, 219, all voting Democrats last week voted for two resolutions. One, opposing sanctions for on Hamas, that is supporting terrorism, and the other one was opposing supplemental military assistance to Israel during the military clash with Hamas. Um, and this was, I think, a, a striking moment because if it continues, it means that uh, the uh, anti-Semites in the Democrat Party have transformed Israel into a leper that nobody is allowed to you know, have anything to do with in the Democratic Party. And that will be quite a disaster, but I'm not sure how long lived it will be because American society is still very pro American and both and very pro Israel. So we'll just have to see. But I think that, you know, Israel is not a standalone issue. Anti Semitism is not a standalone issue in the United States. They're part and parcel of uh, the progressive left's anti Americanism. And, you know, if this is, if they're able to, to succeed in, transforming the United States into a post-American America, which is clearly what they're aiming towards, then yes, America will become a very, very, very hostile power towards Israel. Not a happy note to end on. Well, I have faith that things might turn around. And and when you see the diminished support for its critical race theory, for Black Lives Matter, which is an openly anti-Semitic organization, and you know Americans, and you know how how much they love their country. Um, you know you have to you have to keep the faith that things will change. But Israel does have to prepare for a rainy day, and uh, and be aware that we are facing an incredibly hostile administration that clearly not only wants to realign towards Iran, but that they're openly supportive of Hamas. Or else Texas should secede, maybe along with Florida this time. <laughs> well, so I think everybody wants to move to Florida, so they might just fall where, into where the Atlantic ban, Ocean. Where, where they, They're going <laughs> to where, where they ban critical race theory, and where they and 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 where the governors are fighting against the dictatorship. And you of know social that media. that Rick DeSantis is one when he was in uh, Congress is one of the most mm -hmm. pro-Israel la lawmakers in Congress. I met with him several times. He was here right after Trump got elected, scouting out locations for the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. I mean, he came on his own. You know, I mean, I've met him for dinner or something like that. What a guy! He is amazing. No. So I think and you know it may happen that the Floridians just decide that they're going to secede and maybe they'll conquer Cuba and uh, it'll all be good. And, you know, we'll just see, we'll just see that. But, you know, the but isn't it amazing that once you're on the right moral side of things, you're also against critical, once you're for Israel, you're also against critical race theory and you're against Facebook. It's, it just figures. Did you know that Facebook locked me out this past week? Like I wasn't able to post my articles. You know, I'm not a big poster on Facebook because I don't trust them, but I couldn't even get into my account for over a week. And it wasn't just because I'm, you know, illiterate from a computational perspective. I mean, I, I was trying to get it, but they were they were locking me out. It's because you're a colonizer. And note that Mark Zuckerberg knows where you are at any single moment, watching you through the camera of your computer. I can't I can't help but end with a joke because it just was so a meme that I saw, <laughs> which was so funny. I don't remember the comedian, but he said, he says, you know, um, my wife said to me, why are you whispering? And I said, I don't know, maybe Mark Zuckerberg is spying on us. And she laughed. So I laughed. So Siri laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 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 yep. There you go. I, I've, I've heard other jokes like that, but I'm suddenly so... I'm so entranced by your joke, I don't remember it anymore. I'll try to remember it for next week. But yeah, uh, we live in very interesting times, and so it's important to keep Absolutely. our sense of humor. And by the way, for all of you Hebrew speakers, Latma will have yet another episode on Channel 20. I don't know if you guys know, but I, I am the editor and founder of Israel's premier uh, Zionist satire reviews, Latma, and uh, we were on online for many, many years, and now we're in our second season on Israel Channel 20. So... You can tune in there too. And if you want to contribute to our work. 
that would be great. Anyway, if you have any comments on what we're saying in our show, feel free to, you know, obviously post your comments on YouTube and on, uh, and on rumble, which you're going to subscribe to and send out to everybody, you know, and, uh, and some people you don't even, if you just want to, you know, educate them, but also you can email me at Carolyn at Carolyn uh, with your comments and, I don't promise because I'm spammed all the time, but I will try to answer you. And if you have ideas for future shows, we'd love to hear them. So spread the news about the Carolyn Glick uh, Middle East News Hour with Gotti Tao. And uh, <laughs> tune in next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. It was a pleasure. It's always fun. Bye. Bye.